Ugh, give me a moment, I've just woken up. If you start looking into serial killers, you will find that there is so many out there and they've got different reasons to why they kill people. And some can be race motivated, potentially like the case that I'm going to be talking about today. And this case sent New Orleans into a paralyzing fear in 1918, as an axeman was on the loose, killing people in their own homes with an ax. To this very day, these cases remain unsolved. Hello and welcome back or welcome to my channel. If you don't know what's going on here, I'm a horror artist and I like to draw what I talk about in the videos. I like scary facts, true crimes, conspiracies, anything to do with aliens, UFOs, you'll find it here on my channel. And I love drawing so I combine them all to hopefully give you a unique experience across these genres. Now any of the information that you hear in this video today has been consistently viewed across all the research that I have done and I've compiled it into my video. So I do my best to bring you the most accurate information. Now I'm just going to quickly do some shameless self-promotion here. If you don't already know this, I actually have an Etsy store and I've had it for like over six years now where I actually make horror felt pattern toys so you can buy the pattern and actually make the toy. Now there is horror characters from movies. I've got my own creations of horror designs on there. Most recent is a evil Mr. Meeseeks, which is from Rick and Morty. So you can get that. He even has bendable arms. I have an Oogie Boogie smaller pattern. I actually have a pillow version on my site where you make it with a sewing machine, but I decided to make a smaller version. So anyone who just wants to make something out of felt, here it is. I also made lock shock in barrels so you can buy these little guys in the pattern and make them yourself. And I made some cursed Teletubbies. So hop across to my store if you're interested in oh god the hair there. So hop across to my store if you want to get any of these. If you're feeling creative and you want to make your own toys for your kids or for yourself completely up to you. Now enough about that, let's get on with the video and let's get on with the drawing. By August 1918, the Italian immigrant community in New Orleans, Louisiana, were completely terrified. The husbands in the households were staying up all night just to protect their families, just in case the axemen happened to target them. The axemen attacks happened between 1918 and 1919 in New Orleans. Then he decided to go to Gretna across the Mississippi River for his final kill. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, a lot of the Italian community relocated to New Orleans before the Civil War for work, as cheap labour was required for the sugarcane and cotton plantations, and this did in return give them a better life and a chance to save money, and in a few years of working, the immigrants had saved enough money to start their own businesses, and this was usually a fruit or grocery store. So the sugarcane and cotton companies saw this as a huge problem as they couldn't keep employees. Unfortunately, a stigma started to form against the Italian immigrants when organized crimes and violence started happening and word got around about the mafia being responsible, which is an Italian creation. So people started to take grudges out on the immigrants and a new race war was born with vendettas being applied as it would seem with the Axeman attacks. The first people attacked by the serial killer named the Axeman was Joseph and Catherine Maggio on the 23rd of May 1918. They were asleep in their apartment above their grocery store when the killer broke in in the middle of the night and slit their throats of the couple before bashing in their heads with an axe. Apparently, Catherine's throat was cut so deep that her head was basically decapitated. When the authorities turned up to investigate, they found the killer's clothes covered in blood in the couple's apartment, as it appeared that he just changed into clean clothes to hide the evidence when he left. No money or valuables were stolen, so it did not appear to be a robbery, but the killer had written a message with chalk near the couple's home that said, Mrs. Joseph Maggio will sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. The axe was then found in the bathtub. The Mrs. Tony reference was speculated to be from a murder in 1912 of Tony Syambra's wife, which they alleged 
that the Axemen might have had something to do with. Tony's wife was always known to her customers as Mrs. Tony. It was later revealed that Catherine had died from suffocating on her own blood that filled her neck as it was being slit. The killings and attacks started to take on patterns. The killer would attack at night while the victim slept. He used a chisel at the back door to gain access to the properties and used an axe that was already located on the property he was entering. But the most disturbing trait to the crimes was the killer's taste for killing or attacking Italians with small businesses that usually dwelled above their stores. Roughly a month later, after the official first attack from the Axemen, on the 27th of June 1918, Louis Bashuma and his mistress Harriet Lowe were attacked with an axe in their apartment located at the back of their store. Once they did not open their store the next day, they were discovered laying in their blood with Louis having axe wounds above his right temple and Harriet suffering axe marks to her left ear. Surprisingly, they both survived despite their severe injuries but Harriet did suffer from being paralyzed down her face so she had surgery to correct this but she died two days later but before she died she told police that she thinks Lewis did it so he went to jail for nine months on the 5th of August 1918, a third attack was done on a 28-year-old, 8 months pregnant woman named Mary, who was the wife of Edward Schneider, who was working late when the attack happened while she was laying in bed. Edward got home just after midnight to find his wife's scalp cut open and her face unrecognisable from the amount of blood covering it. She too surprisingly survived and gave birth two days later to a healthy baby girl. It was found that the axe apparently wasn't used. She was attacked by her own bedside lamp. A few days later, on the 10th of August, another grocer who was elderly named Joseph Romano was attacked in his home, which he shared with his two nieces. He too was attacked with an axe to the head while he slept and was found by his nieces who heard the commotion. The nieces saw the man fleeing their property. Joseph survived initially and was able to walk to the ambulance that came for him, but he did die two days later due to severe head trauma. The nieces did, however, give a little bit of a description of the killer. He apparently was dark skinned, big built and was dressed in black with a hat. By now the city was alive with paranoia and fear with reports coming in that the axes and chisels were found in backyards and doors and windows looked like they had been tampered with. People started carrying guns and sitting up all night watching and waiting to blow away the murderer. Reports even came in that the killer was posing as a woman as some people caught the man leaving some of the homes that, that were, they were protecting dressed in women's clothing. Because of this, the killings just stopped and no more were reported and things seemed to go back to normal until the 10th of March 1919 when the Axeman reared his ugly head one more time in Gretna. Charles and Rosie Cortamiglia were attacked with an axe while they slept with their two-year-old daughter Mary lying with them. Screams were heard by neighbour grocer Lolando Giordano who rushed to the Cortamiglia's home. Rosie woke to seeing a large man fighting with her husband when he was struck in the head and fell to the floor. Rosie, clutching her daughter, was struck next with the killer smashing the axe into both of them. Rosie suffered a severe head wound and survived, but her daughter Mary died from the axe wound. Charles survived too, and Rosie went on to blame 69-year-old Lolando and his 18-year-old son, Frank, for the attacks, but Charles told them his wife was wrong. Lolando and Frank were sentenced, Lolando life in prison, and Frank to be hung. Charles divorced Rosie over the accusations, and a year later, Rosie retracted her statement that Lolando and Frank were to blame. They were both released from jail. This put the area back on high alert and residents started arming themselves again. Then something strange happened. The local newspaper received a taunting letter from the killer on the 14th of March 1919 that promised another attack if jazz music wasn't playing in the location of the attack. 
He claims that they will never catch him and he is a spirit or demon that kills people to send them to hell to keep him company. And at 12.15 earthly time on Tuesday night, he will be back in New Orleans and whoever isn't playing jazz music in their home will get the axe as he is very fond of jazz music. That evening on Tuesday the 19th of March, New Orleans was alive with jazz music in homes and everyone who didn't have a stereo crammed themselves into clubs and pubs that had jazz music playing from a band or from a music box no one died that night and it went quiet with no attacks for nearly five months until the 10th of august 1919 when grocer steve bocker was attacked with an axe while he slept he survived and was able to get to a neighbor's home for them to call the ambulance he couldn't tell authorities any details about the attack as he couldn't recall On the 2nd of September 1919, a local druggist named William Carson escaped the wrath of the Axeman when William was ready with a gun and fired several shots at the Axeman. The killer left the axe behind. On the 3rd of September 1919, a girl named Sarah Lawman was hacked at while she slept. She awoke, screamed, and neighbours heard her cries and went to check on her and found her unconscious in her bed with a severe head wound and missing several teeth. She survived with a brain injury and the axe was found on the front lawn of where Sarah lived. Two months went by without any incidents, but on the 27th of October 1919, the very last attack by the Axeman would happen. Grocer Mike Peppertoni was killed in his sleep, and his wife woke to the commotion to find a big axe-wielding man running from the scene after hacking at Mike's head. Mike left behind his wife and six kids, and his wife could not describe anything about the killer. Nothing stood out. Even though the authorities worked tirelessly on the case, they never solved it and the Axeman never terrified New Orleans again, like he just crawled back into the hiding place he came out of. Maybe he really was a demon from hell. So who could the Axeman be? Was the Axeman part of the Mafia? Or was he a disgruntled fellow grocer that was trying to eliminate the competition that were Italian immigrants? Or was this random attacks? Was the reason he was never heard of again because he relocated and may have done things differently with other murders throughout history? Or did he take his own life after the incidents? Or was someone or was he promoting jazz music? Because the article that was put into the newspaper, I'm pretty sure that I reckon that wasn't the killer. I reckon that was someone trying to promote jazz music at the time, trying to get it off the ground. One thing we do know is that whoever the killer was, he must have been stalking and interacting with the people he killed. And if an axe wasn't found, other objects were used. Allegedly, by most of the survivors, if a description of the killer was later remembered, they said that the killer was a white working class man around 30 years old. He was said by police to be an experienced burglar by his manner in which he did the break-ins. They were very clever. There was even speculation that the killer had been killing for years since 1910 and 1911 as roughly eight people in this time frame in Louisiana had been killed or attacked and survived by an axe-wielding man. Even in 1920 to 1921, there were cases in Louisiana of four other people who suffered attacks by an axe. Now, the prime suspect ended up being a man named Joseph Mumphrey, who went by other aliases as well. He was shot dead in 1920 by the widow of Mike Peppertoni after she had remarried and relocated to Los Angeles. Joseph approached Mrs. Peppertoni and asked her to hand over her money and jewelry, or he would kill her the same way he killed her husband. She shot him 11 times, but this story is said to be just a story and no proof was ever really found of this happening. Now let me know what you think about this case. Do you think any of these people that were mentioned would have been, maybe have been part of the murders? Do you think that one of them may have done it? 
or do you think you know this was just something that was just a complete stranger someone random and they were just passing through and happened to stay in New Orleans for a while and just wanted to kill people there and then just moved on just went other places and or, or maybe died who knows it's definitely strange that these attacks only just happened in certain times and then they sort of never happened again unless like I said he changed his tactics and did other types of killing but the illustration that I decided to do for the video today it's not my favorite but it's just the image that I had for this story I just want to do this creepy weird person with these slits up his face but they've been stitched together it's kind of like he's hacked it himself and then had himself like stitched up and he's got axes he's got an axe in his head he's got there's an axe in a rock that he's putting his leg on because he's feeling pretty proud of himself for what he's done to people he's got a big axe he's got some small axes he's got some medium sized axes and they're just covered in blood because it's just representing all the death that in in the attacks that this guy done and yeah i don't know who he is but we're never going to find out because i'd say he is long dead by now because obviously he would have been an adult uh back then and it's been basically over a hundred years so unless he was a demon he ain't alive no more so anyway that is it from me hopefully you enjoyed this video if you like this kind of content like and subscribe dislike it i really couldn't care less because any interaction helps the algorithm pick me up and find other people that would like this kind of content and i will see you guys in the next one bye